I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters, your source for all things business. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Philip Kovacs on the line, and he's CEO over at Tango Tango. Phil, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, so... Um, Philip, I'm excited to get into Tango Tango, and we're going to talk about the, the technology and what you're doing and how you're helping first responders and even new markets that you're exploring. Um, but before we get into that, uh, I'd like to take a couple steps back and really get a feel for like, how did you end up on this uh, entrepreneurial journey? Because it's a little bit unorthodox, I'd say. Yeah, the, um, the journey definitely had its twists and turns. I started out uh, teaching high school English. Um, that would later transition into a PhD in policy studies and a uh, career at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after earning tenure, which um, I'm sure you're aware once you earn tenure, it's pretty difficult to lose your position. Yeah. Um, I wound up quitting uh, to go work for a startup. And I, I thought my father, uh, who was a taxidermist, was going to come up here and uh, kill me for doing that, for leaving a, you know, a tenured faculty position. But it wound up being one of the best decisions of my life. Um, helped grow that company, which was at the time a tutoring company, helped pivot it into a software company and grew it from less than a million recurring to just under 48 million in ARR uh, in about 48 months. Um, so exited that when it got a little big and unwieldy, you know, growing a company is one thing, sitting on top of something big is another. And Huntsville's actually got a pretty good ecosystem for startups. Mm. So left to, to find what the next big thing was going to be. And, and that wound up being Tango Tango. Um, started here uh, just as a consultant in 2018 and um, helped the company establish product market fit. Mm. Um, we had a, a liking for one another and I was offered the chief operating um, officer position. And that later became CEO. And I've been doing it since um, August of 2019. Man, what an amazing story. And when you said uh, your dad almost came up there because he left a tenured faculty position, I'm, like, I'm thinking to myself, what? Uh, that's, uh, it, it's quite a story. And I feel like there's some people watching this right now that maybe um, they're, they're considering, you know, you know, startup world, entrepreneur, um, safety or perceived safety, let's just say, of a, a type of a corporate position. Um, I mean, what, what, were, like, what went through your mind, if I can take you back a little bit, that kind of helped you make that decision? Oh, well, I think part of the either blessing or, or curse for me is that I've got a short attention span. So 10 years in one position was probably three years too many at the, at the university. Um, and it was just, you know, an opportunity to reinvent myself. I am not risk adverse. And I, I think that's probably a quality that entrepreneurs have to have. You know, there's a lot that you put on the table, like you said, to make a career transition. Um, so, you know, getting comfortable with risk, um, taking a look at at what makes you happy and whether or not you are so. And if you're not doing what you love, um, considering the change. Man, and, and so then you move on to a company and you grow it from a million to, I think you said over 40 million, like uh, mm -hmm. ARR, that's, I mean, that's a, a tremendous feat in itself. Um, what kind of, and, and obviously there's going to be a lot, but what kind of things that just stick out in your mind about that experience that maybe have helped you um, on your path to Tango Tango, which we'll get into next? Yeah, sure. I would like to acknowledge that that growth was a result of a pretty phenomenal team. Mm -hmm. So finding the right people um, to get in the right seats on the bus was, was crucial uh, there. So there was a lot of people behind that growth. Um, the willingness to, to really sounds so trite, but to get your hands dirty, when you're growing that fast, you, you know you're going to have some problems. It's the problems that you don't know that you're about to have that, that creep up and kill you. Mm -hmm. There was at one point in time, quick story here, um, where we realized that we, we just brought on this huge customer and we were missing something like 250 phone calls a day from people who were calling with questions about support. And we had to really go live with the customer support center uh, in about 48 hours. And that was everything from wiring the building ourselves, bringing in the phones and then creating manuals for people who were taking these phone calls. So just, just getting ready and being willing to, to crawl around on the floor, plugging phones up, so to speak, <laughs> it's important. 
Oh my gosh, I think you just now defined the, like, the epitome of the startup world in itself. <laughs> so, so what was that like? Yeah, we crawled, or we're, we're plugging in flow lines ourselves, we just get it done. Like, I love it. And I love that spirit. And that's kind of one of the things that I personally like about the about the startup world in general versus the traditional. I mean, because there's some there's some differences between those two, um, between those two worlds, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've spent most of my life probably not quote unquote in the real world because I went through academia, you know, got my master's. I taught high school for a little while and then got my PhD. But there's, if you're in a startup, you have to be willing to ignore titles or accept whatever title um, you might need in that hour. So it might be guy who strings together phone system for taking phone calls. Um, and I think you have to get, you know, really quickly past the sort of silo or territory and being willing to to jump in wherever it's needed awesome rest and you know in a traditional company you get really um demarcated roles and that you know that's again that's that's not really what i'm most interested in mm -hmm. probably owning to my adhd so let's uh let's get into tango tango so um now now you've transitioned there your ceo um first off maybe tell us a little bit about the company yeah, so, you know, we were founded in 2016, and it was just a harebrained idea, and that was two guys, one retired law enforcement who was doing some consulting, mm -hmm. and then the owner of a radio shop, and they were talking about, you know, basically, these are handheld computers now, right, your phone, and the fact that most teenagers are walking around with more advanced technology than first responders who are still using radios and still using pagers, like firefighters right now get alerts via pager. And they thought, you know, we could do something where we can augment existing technology using using the Internet, you know, and hosting it in the cloud. Um, so that sort of harebrained idea was was taken to someone with some expertise, our current CTO, mm -hmm. and they got a proof of concept rolled out in 2017, um, struggled for a bit with product market fit. I think that everyone on the team at that point in time will acknowledge um, and I'm sure you know this is true. Having a good idea is one thing. Being able to get it to market is a completely different um, monster to slay. And you know, there was just a sort of serendipitous timing where I was doing some pro bono consulting in the community just to to, to give back um, and to make myself feel better about doing fishing on the side, which is essentially all I was doing after I left uh, the first gig. Um, and got to sit down with these guys and and really liked what they were doing and and liked the product and. We did sort of a deeper dive into what was keeping them from getting traction. And once we figured that out, um, and it was essentially getting a sort of a frictionless demo up and running. Once we get a demo running with a, a first responder, we've got about a 50% close rate. So the trick is getting that kit into their hands and getting it started. And we just started multiplying the number of kits and essentially uh, throwing them at potential customers, knowing that if we could get them to turn it on, 50% of them would pay to keep it on. And that's really how we got we got traction. Wow. So how, talk about a little bit more about what it was like or what it's like to get into that market of first responders. And, and because this, this isn't an easy um, not to crack, so to speak. It's not your typical B2B sale because you might be dealing with municipalities. You might be dealing with smaller um, ambulance services, contract. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated space. Yeah, absolutely. The sales cycle is... It's either really quick because someone has said, hey, you've got to try this technology and you've got a real need for it, or it can be really drawn out, like you said, because you're going through councils, you're getting approval, there's bids sometimes that need to go out and that sort of thing. Um, the, the number one hurdle really, you know, we're still in early adopter mm -hmm. phase is this is trust issue because we're, we're literally sending a black box out to first responders and asking them to hardwire it into their uh, communication center. And if you ask most uh, first responders what the number one tool they have is, it's their radio, because yeah. that's the tool that allows you to call 10 different, you know, men or women to come help you who may have, you know, 10 different tools for whatever situation you're in. So uh, there were a lot of fire chiefs, police chiefs who, when we first got this going, you know, just said, what are you absolutely talking about? There's no way I'm going to, I'm going to hook this thing up. Yeah. And that was the big, you know, the trust, it still is to a certain extent, but now we can rely on referrals. Wow. 
And so let's talk a little bit more about the user experience. So let's say old technology, old system versus now, like how the old one worked and how the new one works, just to give it like a really clear picture, because there's going to be some people possibly watching this that are in that position to make a to make a decision on adopting a technology like this. And I just want to make it really crystal clear some of the benefits. Sure. If I get too deep into the rabbit hole, just give me a, a, a gentle verbal yank and I'll, I'll dial it back. We do not replace radios. We mm -hmm. augment existing systems. So what we do is if someone's interested, we'll send them out a kit with a customized cable. It's built especially for whatever radio they have. About 80% of the radios in America are Motorola's. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a variety of different kind of cables for, for each uh, particular model. That cable is going to connect to, and there's no trade secrets here. Everything that we're doing um, is all off the shelf technology. Um, so we use an analog to digital gateway, which converts um, your, your voice to ones and zeros, just to oversimplify that a bit. And then we connect that to a, a cradle point, which has a SIM card in it. That's exactly what your cell phone has in it, that then connects to the, um, to the network. Once uh, we get you up in the cloud, we can do all kinds of cool stuff that your traditional radio can't do. Uh, first and foremost, we solve what's called the interoperability problem. Uh, this problem first came to light in, uh, when 9-11 occurred, and that was you had NYPD unable to talk to New York Fire Department. And you even had some agencies within NYFD who couldn't talk to one another because they didn't have compatible frequencies. If you're on Tango Tango, you can talk to anyone else who's using the service. So we're device uh, carrier agnostic. You can be on a Verizon cell phone using their push to talk coming out of a Motorola or a Harris radio, uh, crystal clear. Yeah. Um, the second problem we really solve is what we call the geography problem. So traditional radios are limited by um, how much power is behind the signal. And oftentimes, uh, so for example, in Latuna Canyon, California, the hills and valleys block those signals. Uh, in inner city, you have, say, um, Athens High School, uh, their lockers and their concrete prevents radio from getting inside, even cell phone. So because we can work over um, Wi-Fi in this particular case, we can use Wi-Fi then to sell and then get them into to the, the cloud that way, solving the, that problem. And then finally, um, most first responders, uh, especially volunteer fire, they get into this job because they want to help people. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing for a first responder is to miss a call for help. So, for example, with uh, firefighters, they might have a radio and a pager. Well, if they're out to dinner, um, it's unlikely that they've got that giant radio or that pager sitting on the dinner table with them. Uh, we've got alerting over their phone. So um, we've got a phrase, never leave your team. And that's it. You can be connected no matter where you are. Um, in fact, we had a police chief on vacation in Jerusalem uh, calling a high-speed chase through southern Georgia. Wow. That's amazing. That's, yeah. a, that's an amazing story, and I get it, and it just, and it, and it makes perfect sense, the problem that you're solving. You're basically bringing, you're, again, not replacing radios. You're just bringing the technology and the purpose behind it to, you know, modern times, right? Like, just exactly. Like what we're doing. Um, exactly. That's awesome. It makes it makes a lot of sense. So what has been your your kind of experience now as we're recording this in 2021 um, with, with adoption and just, you know, what's going on pandemic, all these other things like what, what's been your experience along that line? Yeah, so I mean, 2020 was a, a mixed bag for us. Mm. Uh, on one hand, you, you know, our, our smaller agencies rely on tax revenue to make purchases such as this. And when you have um, cities shut down and they're not taxing beer, wine, gas, whatever, because of the slowdown and there's um, less income available for what some agencies see as an add on. Mm. Um, on the flip side, you have some larger agencies who are looking at a twenty five million dollar upgrade and then looking at something like us that costs five grand a year. And that's a no brainer. For example, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority is one of our customers. And I won't get super into the, the granular details here, but they're looking at a radio upgrade and they're putting that off. Instead, they added 300 users um, on the fly. So, um, you know, where there's doors shutting in one place, there's always something opening in another. That's probably the second cliche thing I've said on this interview, but it's, <laughs> it's very true. You know, if there's a crisis, that means there's also an opportunity. You've just got to figure out where that opportunity is. 
Um, so we slowed a bit, um, but we still grew 80% over 2019 and 2020. Uh, looks like we're rebounding pretty well here at the beginning of, of 2021. Mm, fantastic. So let's talk about some maybe other markets and other things that you're exploring because, okay, so we definitely know that you have a really good foothold in first responders and that's going to continue to climb. Um, what are some of the other markets that are interesting to you? Yeah, so there's some similar use cases that, that right away we fit into. Um, Jack Daniels uses us. Now it's their fire brigade, but they've got their own fire department, which makes sense given, given what they're protecting. Yeah. Um, then we've got security companies that use us. Again, that makes a lot of sense. It's sort of like a lookalike audience um, for law enforcement to a, to a certain degree. Uh, you we've got a handful of utility companies. Um, if a tornado comes through, you might have six different utility companies showing up to get lines back up. And oftentimes it can take an hour and a half before there's a routing to where one person from one company knows that they can touch a line. So again, we can eliminate that downtime. Obviously that, that saves a great deal of money. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're most um, interested in and excited about here is the logistics industry. Warehousing, uh, shipping, trucking, well, shipping and trucking is the same thing. Um, people on forklifts. So the, the global logistics industry will be a $23 trillion a year industry um, by 2022. And every node, every step of the way uses radio. So we're excited about getting in there uh, and doing some things such as uh, data analytics. Mm. So right now you've got all this uh, radio traffic going on uh, between say a gun on a forklift, someone in a, in a boat that's coming into port and a truck mm. or a train that's waiting to have all this loaded on. Well, none of those people can talk to each other. Uh, so imagine, first of all, that we get them talking to each other mm -hmm. and then imagine what we could do after listening to a couple thousand hours of traffic and noticing insights. Uh, so we're excited about that direction and that future for us. Yeah, it seems like the, ex I mean, logistics, just the explosive growth, right? So everybody's yeah. ordering everything now is what it yep. comes down to. And it's not True. ending. I mean, earlier this, or was it last year now that what was going on in the ports in LA, like the backups, like mm -hmm. just crazy. So when I think about like you saying uh, logistics in general, I'm like, it's a massive industry to be able to tackle and a huge problem to be able to solve. So I guess some of the, um, some of the low hanging fruit and the, some of the low hanging problems that you'd be solving would just be, you know, efficiencies, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, that's going to be the most straightforward, but then again, you've got, you know, um, warehouse supervisors who want to know what's going on when they're outside of radio range. Mm. So again, this is a way for people to always stay connected and imagine for a second that you were the, the COO for, you know, global logistics for McDonald's and, and knowing that you could flip on a switch and listen to what's going on in a warehouse anywhere in the world. Wow. That's going to give you valuable insight, but it's also going to change the behavior of people working in those warehouses. Because today when a supervisor leaves, you're free to do whatever you want because you're mm -hmm. not being monitored. Um, and I speak from experience. I actually drove a forklift outside of Hartsfield International when I was working on my PhD. Uh. Wow. So I want to, I want to look at the, listen to that um, or, or step back a minute. So imagine being the CEO, you said of McDonald's and can listen yeah. to a, a warehouse anywhere sure. in the, in your entire supply chain with a, mm -hmm. the click of a button. Exactly. Be pretty powerful. That's extremely powerful. Um, and, and, and especially for these big organizations, but small ones too, like these, like your, our, our small businesses, I mean, that it may be even more crucial for them to be able to have that conversation when they're, or to, to listen in if they're, uh, if on their, on their one warehouse, right? Cause that may be even more meaningful in this case, but uh, I do like your McDonald's example. So, so Phil, um, so Philip, what's next for Tango Tango? Like uh, you're obviously in, in growth mode. You're obviously growing quickly. I think you said over 80% um, year over year from 2019, I believe you said. Um, mm -hmm. So you're growing a lot. They brought, I'm sure that one of the reasons why you were brought into the company as CEO was to, uh, to help grow it. Um, what's next? So what's next is scaling the model. We think that we've got something figured out with you know, you hear about um, lifetime value to customer acquisition cost. We're about 10 to one on that, which is pretty sweet. Um, and now we, we want to pour fuel on the fire and, and expand nationally. Um, the, the challenge for us right now, or the opportunity is finding good salespeople. Mm. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama, the, the unemployment rate is hovering right around 3%, which is 
awesome unless you're looking to hire people and then it's a nightmare. <laughs> so, you know, hiring uh, sales folks from across the country is, is, the net, is the next step for us. Oh man, H hiring salespeople, that's a, a good problem to have and a good one to solve. Um, and uh, I I'm sure you're aggressively working on that one because that that's what you do. So this is good. Um, so Phil, it's been awesome having you on the show today. I've been really enjoyed um, learning more about Tango Tango, learning more about what you're doing, how, the problems you're solving for our first responders and also logistics industries and also um, and the other ones that you're exploring. So I mean, I think it's a great work and, and it just makes so much sense like what the way you say it and um and bringing the technology bringing the, the old technology of radio upgrading it so to speak and making it to where it's uh to present day i mean it's just it's just awesome so that being said um great having you on the show to everybody watching as always thank you for tuning in don't forget to hit the subscribe button and also um hey if you're out there looking for i, I I just heard you just heard from the from uh, the man's mouth himself. They're hiring right now. So if you're a sales guy out there or gal and you want and you want to be considered, um, what's the best way for people to learn about Tango Tango in general, Philip? Yeah, Tango Tango dot net. Uh, there's you, you can't go to that page without seeing 20 different ways to get in touch with us. And, and we are we're, we're looking for for sales reps across the country. So um, if someone's looking for mission driven work and, um, you know, even if you don't have a background in the first responder um, vertical, we're looking for seasoned sales reps. Fantastic. Philip, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.